And so we give them the power to basically set it and forget it, let us do the work for them and mm. book a tea time for them in their sleep, which literally happened for me last night. <laughs> at a, at nice. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Mercury Rays. With Mercury Rays, startup founders no longer have to navigate roadblocks alone. Visit mercury.com slash raise to get access to a network, connections, and advice. Corient. Real wealth requires real solutions. Corient provides wealth management services centered around you. For more information, speak with an advisor today at corient.com. And Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. All right, everybody, welcome back to this week in startups. As you probably know, uh, golf is one of the most valuable sports in the United States right now. Uh, last year, more than 25 million people played golf at an actual golf course. Let that sink in. That's about 10% of the population. And there are about 10,000 golf courses uh, open to the public here in the United States. Since COVID hit, man, golf has exploded even more uh, with the last three years being the three biggest years on record for golf in America. So we have a founder uh, who is innovating in the golf space, specifically in getting those tee times, booking those uh, really coveted tee times. Loop Golf helps golfers book tee times uh, automatically. And the uh, CEO and co-founder is Matt Holder. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having us. Uh, so you can I, I met you through uh, Foundry University, our program. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, before we get into what you're doing at Loop Golf, you went, I think, to cohort five. We're on cohort six now. Yep. Maybe you could just tell everybody how you found out about Foundry University and what the 12 weeks was like briefly. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, how I found out about the about the program was actually mentioned it, I think a couple times on the All In podcast, which you know I listen to every week. Big fan. And uh, you. you know, when I heard about it, I'm, I took a look, and the description of the program just sounded like exactly what we needed. Twelve week program, lots of high energy, lots of accountability to just make ra rapid progress. And hmm. at the end of it, it was just like found it to be a really fantastic way to uh, just spend twelve weeks and get a good crash course and kind of like the, everything in startups that honestly, I think everyone in tech should probably take at some point in their life. But you've and, been an uh, entrepreneur before. So you knew I a have. lot of the information in the program. Uh, but uh, you spoke a little bit about accountability there. Maybe maybe you could just before we get into Lube Goff here, just talk a little bit about how that manifests itself in, in a 12 week program like Founder University. As you know, as a part of the program, giving updates on a week on a weekly basis is a core part of it. And that just gives built-in accountability for making sure that you are doing the things on a day-to-day -day basis at an hour hour by hour basis to make that ra rapid progress so that you have the you know a growing trajectory of uh, you know updates to give as well as yeah. the community that you guys foster with each of the cohorts and the extended family of cohorts there's a lot of just kind of natural community accountability as well because you want to be able to share uh, share wins with each other and there's a lot of activity in that uh, you know, and the community there on that as well. So it was really great. Awesome. Yeah. And it's great to be part of a group, right? Because it's kind of lonely being a founder. And, you know, <laughs> if you're if you're in the group, I find Absolutely. You, know, you can yeah, other people are suffering through product market fit and that really hard journey trying to get product velocity going, which is hard, you got to get a team that's willing to crank. I actually read your updates. Uh, it's one of the things people don't know is I hang out in the founder university database and I look at who's sending updates and I just peruse them. I'll just spend an hour looking at them. You did eight of 12 weeks, 67% of your updates. And uh, <laughs> I liked watching each week. We asked people for their one simple sentence. And you know, you started like, and you try one week was like kayak for golf. You know, by the end, it was like, oh, the easiest, the quickest way to book a tea time. And then it was in the United States. But you know, the easy way to book a tea time, uh, it was yeah. just such an elegant way to explain it. So let's talk a little bit about what loop golf is, uh, and, and why the world needs it. Awesome. Yeah, so loop is, uh, as you said, the, the quickest and easiest way to book a book a tea time at, at your favorite course in the US. What we've built is a way for golfers to tell us what their preferences are, whether from selecting a course to uh, choosing which date and time they want to play. And then as soon as they book with us, we monitor the course 24 seven, 
automatically booking a tee time as soon as that one appears, which mm-hmm. as golfers know in some markets, especially like LA, San Francisco, Denver and others, it's nearly impossible to get a really great tee time and a great course. And so we give them the power to basically set it and forget it, let us do the work for them and mm. book a tea time for them in their sleep, which literally happened for me last night <laughs> at, a, nice. at, at a course nice. as well. So. so it's sort of like y- there's this inventory that could pop up and you manage that remnant inventory or last minute inventory, which I think is just so brilliant. And then how do you make money from that? We charge on a per transaction basis. Uh, there's a nom- nominal fee that golfers pay as a part of that that turns out to be you know a couple bucks more on a you know fifty to sixty dollar you know mm. per player greens fee, which the feedback we're getting from from our users is probably not enough, and that we should probably yeah. charge more, which is great validation to hear from from our customers because it, golfers don't pay unless until we're su- we successfully book them. There's you know literally no risk to them mm. uh, other than missing out on an opportunity to golf by not booking through us. And so it's a marketplace in a way. Uh, an on-demand marketplace um, as this stuff becomes available. Now, what about um, the tea time software? There's a lot of existing tea time software out there in the world. Maybe you could describe sure. for me, like, h- how do golf courses manage their tea times? So are they using a book or they have it online? It's like open table and it's it's kind of janky, right? A lot of the stuff is old software, I understand. Yeah, it's it's a lot of old software that was created, you know, 15, 20 years ago that golf courses have have been using and it's just kind of been built upon over time. So it's really cumbersome actually as a golfer to use because golf courses in the Bay Area or LA use a handful of different systems. And as a golfer trying to book a tee time, you end up having to create three different accounts and search four different websites in order to try and find that tee time at like midnight just to be able to book the one one that you want to get. And so what we've done is we've done integrations with all of those different uh, disparate services and centralized it all into one one place so that as a golfer you don't have to do that you don't have to you know get ir- have your wife irritated that you're up every night trying to book trying to book golf courses <laughs> trying to snipe like, those like last was. minute <laughs> exactly yeah. so what do they charge for that software i wonder like how much do they charge the golf courses for the that uh, tea time management software you know it's interesting it's uh i think some of the courses and the way that that others do it is they uh, charge probably you know about ten to twenty thousand dollars a year or something like that for for courses to do that and you know there are about five to ten uh, in the u s that that dominate most of the market um, yeah. so it's it's fairly saturated but you know with yeah. dealing with courses they do they consider changing them systems ma- their systems on maybe an annual basis so it's a very long very long sales cycle uh, yeah, like education in. you know yeah. or um, health care. These tend to be pretty hard, you know, you have incumbents in there, but it does seem like there's a lot of room for you to grow. So maybe really quick, show it, show us the UX here and the design of, of the products. You know, one of the things I really liked about what you're doing uh, and attracted me to the team and, and uh, I'm investing in the company. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. Thanks for letting me invest. That's why we do found a university. We want to help people, but we wind up investing in the top, I don't know, 10% of graduates or so. So here uh, I see we're on loopgolf.co, uh, right? Or .co? .co, correct. Yeah. Uh, so I see here Los Angeles Tea Times, uh, Rancho Park, uh, Encino Golf Course, Balboa, yeah, Wilson, a bunch of different uh, golf courses there. So, so how does it work? Yeah, so uh, you know, all a golfer has to do is come to LoopGolf.co, uh, perform a search for you know their their local market, find the course, their favorite course that they want to play, simply tap book tea time, and yep. then they're brought into our wizard, which basically allows them to select their preferences of when and where they want to play. And the beauty of this is that most golf courses have a booking window of like seven to 14 days in advance. You can book as far in advance with us as you want. You could do it every Saturday for the next two years if, if you were so inclined and just have a standing tee time going for you. We'll monitor it just the same as a last minute tee time. With that in mind, like, I don't know, if, uh, I guess the week of Thanksgiving, maybe we want to play, play on Black Friday. So we'll select that date. You select your time window. So what we're finding is a lot of golfers... No, they have a specific time in mind, um, but they actually have a willingness to play between, you know, uh, an hour or two hour range on most days. So sure. we give them the opportunity to uh, to set that however they want, select how many players they want from one to four. So let's just do four because uh, I like to play with buddies. 
uh, set their budget. So sometimes uh, the courses have, sometimes they're charging 50 bucks, sometimes they're charging 60 bucks, depending on, on the day. Um, so we give you the opportunity to tell us what your budget is. We'll lever- use that uh, to determine whether or not we can give you, uh, give you that tea time. We have to at least have a budget equal to what the course is charging. So let's just save 75 for now. And then you tell us here uh, when you want us to stop looking for a tea time. So we will monitor it from the day, from the second it the tea sheet opens all up until you know 24 hours prior to the tea time, six hours prior to the tea time, depending on what your preference is. You know, most courses allow you to cancel with no penalty up to usually like 24 to 48 hours prior. If you want something that's shorter, you just need to let us know like and recognize that this is going to be a non-cancelable tea time. But let's put this to 36. And then once you've done all that configuration, you get to the checkout page summarizes everything that you've chosen, what the course is, all of your preferences. And you can see here that you're going to pay up to the amount of your budget. Um, mm-hmm. but we will charge you whatever the golf, the golf course itself charges. And then you, uh, your fee to us, which is only payable when we're successful in booking your tee time. And then you pay the balance of it at the course, which is what golfers are used to. They typically show up to the, to the pro shop and just pay their tee time once they check in. And then Fantastic. once it's done... We're now monitoring for uh, this tea time. And as I said to you earlier, uh, you know, last night, I was, I was able to successfully book, book a tea time. And it happened while I was sleeping. It was 11, 11 p.m. A typical golfer might be, you know, scouring tea times late at night. I didn't have to do that. I went, went straight to bed. And while I was sleeping, I got a tea time for myself uh, through Loop. And the power of being able to do that is just game changing for golfers. And, and a lot of our, our customers are saying the same thing. You can always tell when you have a good idea that it sparks a lot of feature requests. I'm wondering if uh, folks have said, you know, I'm willing to play at these four courses. I want to play in Los Angeles. Tell me what's available for, you know, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And, you know, give me like a, you know, options instead of just guarantee me paying. Maybe you tell me, hey, there's two options. Pick which one you want. Have you have you thought about that? Like split possibilities, giving them a little window of time. I know when I book tickets for the fancy movie theater, uh, yep. you know, where they charge 15 bucks and they have like the food and the seats. They give you like five minutes when you're booking the seats to kind of make your decision on which seats you want. And, they, and they'll hold them for you while you type in your credit card. Is there any concept like that here? Absolutely. So um, you actually hit on something that we're seeing in the data itself. Uh, we're seeing golfers book the same course, you know, on multiple dates, even though our UI doesn't really conveniently handle that yet. Um, And they're booking uh, different courses for the same date, uh, giving themselves optionality to have hopefully at least one place that they can play. And so we we do know, and we've we've built some user experiences at other marketplaces that my co-founder and I have been a part of that have worked really well to do that. So we have a, a few different feature ideas on that and how we make that a really convenient user experience for golfers so that they can book a backup and at least have somewhere to play on the date that they want to play, as well as, you know, empower them to book, you know, the same place multiple times, just so that it's a lot more convenient to get on the golf course whenever they want. Fantastic. And then in terms of building the company, hard time to build a company, right? You you, you can't get a lot of, you can't raise a lot of money. It's not, it's not easy. How are you running the company and like, running it lean? And and, uh, is the goal here to get to break even profitability quickly, raise a bunch of capital? How are you thinking about the market right now? That's been a big topic of discussion. So you've got a new startup here, you know, obviously, I'm putting a little bit of money in at this time, I'm an investor, but how do you think about the market and and the new reality of running a startup in 2023? That's a great question. Uh, Yes, it's hard. And I think that the key to right now is, is running as lean as possible. You know, other companies in the in the, the really great years of the past 10 years, like they get money and they, they really deploy it really quickly and start really accelerating everything that they're spending on and hiring. We're trying to to employ like from a marketing standpoint, as many kind of like grassroots krill type marketing campaigns to uh, make our dollars go a lot further. At the same time, you know, it's actually part of the, the fun part of being being at a small stage startup and an early stage small startup is is doing things that are really, uh, you know, grinding away and doing things that, uh, you know, I think if you had a lot more money, you wouldn't be willing to do. And it actually gets you a lot closer to your customers, which I think is fantastic because we get to hear straight from straight from our customers what they what they love and what what they wish worked better. And you're referring to, hey, you don't have a lot of money. So maybe you're doing things uh, in terms of marketing that are more guerrilla 
you know, meeting customers and just telling them about the product and getting that first hundred customers into the product? Yeah. So some things that we're doing are just going to golf ranges at courses that we that we work for and showing up and just saying, hey, here's what we're doing. Would you give us feedback on the product and having just a a gentle way of introducing the, the product concept to them? And hearing from them, you know, directly, like, would they use it? Do they want to give it a shot? What do they love about it? What could we improve? And we're leveraging all of that as, uh, you know, data for us to iterate on the product and make it better for our customers. Being a founder is one of the most amazing journeys you could ever go on. I suggest you do it. But you got to know it's going to be hard. And sometimes it's going to be a little bit lonely. But with Mercury Rays, you don't have to go it alone. This is an amazing new program for Mercury. I'm part of it. In fact, Mercury Rays is a founder success platform that's built to remove the roadblocks at every step of the founder journey. And this is going to help you with the number one thing that founders tell me they need money. Yes, Mercury Rays gives you access to investors, and then they give you access to uh, industry experts. And finally, they connect you with fellow founders. What a great idea. It's like what I do in my accelerator, except it's open to everybody, not just people we invest in. So Here's how you use it. And a lot of my founders have been using it. And I'm super happy about this. If you're fundraising, you submit your pitch and you get in front of hundreds of investors who are looking actively to fund businesses like yours. And I'm in that database and I have found good companies in there. If you're looking for guidance, you can tune into unfiltered conversations with industry experts. And if you're craving some community, which I know you are, you can meet fellow founders and navigate similar challenges. So here's your call to action. Mercury Raise was created to help founders navigate obstacles so more startups can become success stories. It's that simple. They care. And you can take your startup to the next stage with Mercury Raise by visiting mercury.com slash raise. That's mercury.com slash raise. In terms of golf, usually there's like 2 million new golfers every year. I see that like there's been 3.3 uh, last year in terms of the number of new people who uh, took on golf. Is this because of Top Golf? I keep hearing people talk about Top Golf and that becoming a bit of a phenomenon. Is it television? Is there like some new Tiger Woods I'm not aware of? What, what's causing this golf craze? Or was it, do you think, just some sort of hangover from the pandemic? Because I thought the idea was like young people maybe wouldn't want to play. It's expensive. It's for old people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just time consuming. They want to be on TikTok, but it seems like a lot of young people are really, really into golf all of a sudden. Well, yeah, what's, no, the, what's behind the, the surge? It's multidimensional. One of it obviously was COVID and golf was one of one of the activities that, you know, you could actually do. And so a lot of people started taking to it. Um, and golfers, people who are already golfers were just doing like me, were doing a lot more of it during that time. But then you had also the introduction of Top Golf. Like Tiger Woods has a new golf league that's coming out that's going to be, you know, very focused on media. I think Steph Curry just invested in, in a team and has based in SF. So there's a lot of money oh, it's coming like, into it. Tell me about that. Yeah, tell me about that Tiger Woods one. Yeah, so it's like the Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy are putting together a golf league that is meant to, I, I believe, be uh, kind of like focused on the uh, between uh, the you know the months that the PGA Tour isn't isn't active and be something that keeps golf as a all, all season, all year, uh, evergreen kind of like media sport. And so they're going to be playing with new formats of how you play golf. I think it's going to be nighttime, which is going to be really cool. Oh, wow. um, super cool. And kind of like a short format, not 18 holes, but maybe three, six or nine holes. So most people don't know most uh, know a lot of information about the concept. But what we do know sounds pretty exciting. But then from a kid's perspective, you also have over these past 10 to 15 years, a lot of parents, I've got young kids myself, uh, kind of going away from some of the more high contact sports Ah, into low contact. Exactly. And And so so soccer and golf would be lower tennis. Exactly. So a lot of kids and parents are steering their kids into into golf. So the surge in golf is, is really led by these younger golfers who are, you know, Gen Z, Gen, Gen Y, Gen Z, and even younger who are coming and pouring themselves into the game. So there's a really interesting, awesome opportunity to have this generational shift in participation in golf that if we do things right in the golf industry can be sustained for, you know, decades. How are the golf courses liking what you're doing? I would, I, I would suspect that some of them love it. They have extra capacity. You're helping them. I suspect other ones that are crowded maybe they are are control freaks and they want to control the whole experience. They don't want you uh, intercepting their business or their customers. So so how do you think about building a marketplace where, you know, maybe some people love you and some people maybe don't, or maybe I'm just projecting into that. 
you know exactly you know where where we are like there's there's love hate relationship that's developing with the golf courses and we went into this wanting to be a positive force not only for golfers but golf courses as well because let's face it like as a golfer i want to go play a course that's well funded takes care of their playing conditions and uh, the course itself so that i can you know continue to play there and and uh, enjoy my time there. So we've purposely built our product such that golf courses retain 100% of the green fee that they that they market, so that they're not losing out. Um, that's something that uh, is new within the golf industry because you know ex existing players have the complete opposite. They actually take money from the course in order to market their uh, you know market their business. And a lot of golf courses over the years have have grown to kind of really really hate that model. And so we're trying to completely flip it on its head and be, be uh, you know, a positive incentive aligned partner, not only with golfers, but courses as well. Um, and we think that over time, we'll be able to develop really close relationships with them. Do, do they track the, the, the golfers on the golf course in real time and know their spacing and stuff like that with any kind of technology? I was just thinking like the marathon, I used to run the marathon. And when we ran the marathon, mm -hmm. everybody started at the same time. But you cross the starting line, you know, in the New York City Marathon, maybe at minute 10 or 15, even 20, if you're the last people, then I understand they put like, you know, RFID things on people's sneakers, and they would, you know, tell you your minute miles, and everybody had a custom start time, as it were. And so do they track? I mean, I, I would think the golf carts they can track, but I don't know if they do, that would be expensive. Maybe to put yeah, IoT uh, on it. How, how do they manage the flow? There is some management there, as you said, like, uh, the golf course, uh, golf carts are kind of like, the most obvious way to do that tracking, but not everybody takes a cart. Um, mm -hmm. And so that makes it a, a, a much larger, more difficult to solve problem uh, in terms of knowing what the pace of play is, where the bottlenecks are on a course, who's where and things like that. So behind that is obviously like a, a problem with playability of a course. And uh, a lot of reasons golfers want early tee times is they know that they can play it in four and a four and a half hours versus if they get out in the afternoon or midday, they might have a six hour round, which is just wow. you know, very time consuming. And a lot of it has to do with pace play and how people navigate the course and different abilities of golfers at different times. So um, it's, it's, Why don't it's they a just very use people's smartphones. Problem. You know, if you had your smartphone on you and you had booked from Loop Golf, then you have GPS. And so if they just said, hey, check in when you get to the golf course, you could know that I checked in and that my phone where my phone is, I could share my location with you. Did, does anybody yeah. do that yet? Funny enough, we do. We actually do a little bit of that. We do have yeah. um, an app that we've built that uh, takes kind of the concepts of an app like Strava, which as as a runner you might you might have used sure, quite a bit, or or a cyclist, um, and combine it with golf. So using uh, you know a smartwatch or your phone, just in the background while you play, un in an unintrusive way, we're following everywhere that you go on the course. When you book around, we're giving you live GPS distances to the front, back, and middle of the green. Uh, ways of keeping your uh, ways of keeping your your score and your stat performance stats, and then at the end of it, we put your path of everywhere you've gone on the course uh, over on a map that's shareable with uh, with your friend with your golf buddies into the broader loop community. Behind that, you know, at some point we can you know obviously use that to give courses better uh, better intelligence about what's happening at, at different times on their course as well as do things like build strategy maps that golfers can use to better understand how to navigate their way around around each hole on the course and hopefully it leads to better scores for them. So, All right, well, listen, I'm super excited. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to Founder University. Thanks for letting me invest and thanks for coming on This Week in Startups. Good luck building it out and uh, encourage everybody to, to just go try lubegolf.co. Uh, is there any uh, specific geos that you're targeting first where you have you know more density of courses because i know like you're you're just rolling out right this is uh, early days right yeah we're uh, we're currently focused on the los angeles metro so if you're a los angeles based golfer please go to loopgolf.co give us a try and and give us feedback tell us what you want to see us do next with loop golf and we're we're listening so and in the other markets you can sign up and like join a wait list or something yeah, other markets you can you can join up. You can let us know which markets you want to cover, and we might launch your market next. Yeah, our friends at Corian provide wealth management services centered around you. Corian's goals are to exceed your expectations, simplify your life, and help you establish a legacy that lasts for generations. Corian has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and 
provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. They're one of the largest integrated fee-only U.S. registered investment advisors, and Corian has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Each team has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of planning, investing, lending, and money management disciplines. The teams at Corian put the collective power of their expertise into building you the custom wealth investment and family office solutions that can help you reach your holistic financial goals, no matter how complex they might be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, speak with an advisor today at Corient.com. That's Corient.com. I think it'd be super cool if like you were in LA, if there was just like a, uh, if you were like a member, like maybe you could become a, have a membership to loop golf. If I was a VIP member, if it just told you like, these are the courses that have availability and you gave me kind of a heat map, almost like, you know, th there's a cool feature on Google flights where you can see a grid and then it shows you, Hey, cause I do this, I mean, it makes no sense. I know, but sometimes I have flexibility in my travel and I'll just tell my assistant like, Hey, when you book my ticket, just look the day before the day after if the ticket prices are radically different. And like, you know, when I went to Italy, I, I could choose my days. So I was like, Oh, let's leave on this day versus this day because, you know, business class was, thousand dollars cheaper if i left on a tuesday instead of a monday or something and I, I don't understand why i guess you know popularity of certain days but yeah you could do some really interesting stuff and in like educating me like hey by the way you know you put in saturday at 10 a.m not a great time but you know if you could figure out how to go on a 7 a.m tuesday and wednesday those are open 16 percent of the time or whatever just some sort of system of like educating yeah. people have you thought about doing something with like real-time education of of golf in tea times yeah yeah i mean like on, on a course basis and day day by day and hour by hour there's differences in in demand uh and yeah. supply and so i think yeah you know, there's a lot there's obviously a lot we can do the first step is that we're taking is just organizing like collecting the data and centralizing the data mm -hmm. just so that we're, we have the ability to do some do some of those things yeah. Obviously, like there's a big AI revolution happening right now too, and I think the golf the golf industry is is kind of not evolved enough yet to really take advantage of that because mm. the data isn't centralized in a way that yeah. that makes it usable for you know those those models. So I think we have you know in, in doing that we have an advantage of of being able to then make that evolutionary step into doing some AI stuff like that. For example, like golf travel and being able mm. to. Say like, hey, I wanted to go do a bachelor party at or a bachelorette party in Scottsdale. Yep. What are the best courses to play? Build my itinerary and get me the yep. tea times so that is booked. All right, you know everybody's probably thinking this, and I was obviously involved in uh, Uber, which had a very controversial feature surge pricing. And then there's a uh, an app in New York called Dorcia. It's like uh, you can pay five hundred bucks a person in advance to you know, secure Carbone or something on a Saturday I night. The, and I love the reference. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty sick. Um, and you pay that Dorcia like $1,000. And then when you go there, if you spend 600, if we went there and we, you know, didn't order a bunch of wine or whatever, the $400, you still have to pay. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, premium service. Have you thought about surge pricing or had like to offer this amount, you know, to secure a time and, uh, you know, I'm willing to pay a little extra. We have thought about that um, during my time at. So I, I was a, a, a director of product at Zillow a while back, and we had some uh, we had some things that we did in terms of how we sold ads to real estate agents that had a prioritized wait list based off of willingness to pay for certain markets. So that's mm -hmm. something that we we definitely are, are going to explore at some point. And as a part of that, like there's an opportunity also to leverage that to partner uh, more closely with golf courses in a way that they yeah. went to from that. Um, yeah. So it's we we've, we've started testing that a little bit. Um, hmm. and we know that we know that, that, that golfers have a much higher willingness to pay for preferred tee times. So there's a big opportunity yeah. there for us to do that is finding the right mechanism to, yeah, to make it have, a fair system. Yeah. Well, and if you have a bunch of, um, well, I don't know that it needs to be fair necessarily. Um, but you know, if they have some premium times, if you said, Hey, we'll guarantee you that we'll, we'll take that time and we'll give you the extra hundred dollars or the extra 25 a person or 50 a person. Mm -hmm. And then if you just put it into your system, you could take the risk of paying the extra hundred. And then you just email everybody and say, Hey, we've got this extra inventory, just like somebody yeah. who's, you know, uh, you know, a ticket broker or something might take a little bit of risk on having some Taylor Swift tickets or something, but could be really powerful for you to just guarantee some inventory 
And then you you have a certain number of emails in Los Angeles, you could just send it to people and say, Hey, we've got this tea time. Uh, this is the yeah. best tea time of the week. Who wants it? I love that yeah. idea. Yeah, like yeah. that's almost Yeah. Uh, anything else coming up in the product that people should look forward to? Or are you keeping it close to the vest? I don't want to I don't want to give away all your secrets. <laughs> but anything you want to disclose that's coming soon that people can look forward to? Mostly keeping it close to the vest. I mean, we're, okay. uh, you know, launching in LA is is the first uh, kind of like big step towards us getting our marketplace flywheel going. And I think, you know, what, what we're investing in is trying to as successfully as possible, get as many people who order through us back on the golf course um, in the most effective and most convenient ways. So a lot of our focus right now is just in the guts of the product, making sure that that works to a point where we feel like really confident that we can go not just not not LA, but beyond that and launch multiple markets through 2024. So that's, uh, oh. that's, that's, it's the unsexy stuff, but it's yeah. the important stuff to get done. All right, keep grinding. Everybody check out loop golf, L O O P G L O F dot C O. Go ahead and check it out. One of my latest investments. Uh, super excited. If you want to come to founder university, go to founder dot university. We're going to do our seventh cohort. Can't believe we're at seven cohorts already. In the program, um, we'll give a $25,000 investment, friends and family investment, uh, if people need that first check. And, uh, you know, my name's helpful to get that first check on the cap table. Or sometimes we uh, invite people from Founding University to come to the Launch Accelerator. Or sometimes we just directly invest in them like we did here with Loop Golf. All those things are possibilities uh, at founder.university. Uh, and uh, yeah, join the family, join the fun come learn how to build a startup and make the world a better place or make the world uh, how you want to see it operate. Thanks again for coming on the program, Matt, and we'll see you all Thanks, uh, very soon. If you're a SaaS or services company that stores customer data in the cloud, then you need to be uh, SOC 2 compliant, you knew that, from a third party, and you need that third party to close big deals. And if you want to get compliant easier and faster, you need to use Vanta, V-A-N-T-A. -A. Vanta makes it so easy for you to get and renew your SOC 2. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three to five months without Vanta. And Vanta can save you hundreds of hours of manual work and up to 85% of compliance costs. This is a total no-brainer. And Vanta does more than just SOC 2 compliance. They also automate up to 90% compliance for GDPR, HIPAA, and more. You can't afford to lose out on major customers. We all know that. Listen, it's a hard year. Last year was hard. You can't lose those major customers because you don't have your compliance dialed in. Just work with Vanta. Get your compliance automated and tight and tight is right. Lock down those big deals. Here's the best part. Vanta is going to give you $1,000 off. That's 10 hundies. Get $1,000 off at vanta.com slash twist. That's vanta.com slash twist for $1,000 off your SOC 2. All right, everybody, there's some big news earlier this week, California's DMV suspended cruises robo taxi permit uh, due to the company allegedly and this is where it gets interesting withholding footage after the incident in San Francisco a few weeks ago. This means cruise can no longer operate its robo taxis in San Francisco, they're still live in Phoenix, although, given what's happened here in California, if it's true. Uh, I could see them pulling Phoenix's um, license as well. Okay, now, um, I am a big fan of waiting to get all the facts, but we're starting to uh, assemble the facts here. So let's just go through what we know. On October 2nd, there was a hit and run. Uh, that did not involve the cruise vehicle directly. Somebody got hit, a woman, uh, apparently, and they were propelled, sadly, tragically, in front of a cruise vehicle. So, cruise did not do the initial... Uh, strike on this woman the woman uh apparently uh and i'm sorry that this is a bit graphic uh trigger warning if you've been in a car accident i know it's triggering for some people uh but the cruise car slammed on the brakes and reportedly stopped on top of the woman okay this is something that happens when i worked on an ambulance and, and we saw car accidents th this is something that happened with pedestrians you, you get hit you could get hit by two or three cars it's not the first one that kills you in some cases it's, it's the person swerving around the car that got in the accident that hit somebody and clips them that's why if you ever get in an accident on the highway many many people who die on a on the highway it's not from the initial accident it's because they get out on an active highway and they're disoriented and they walk across the highway and then they get struck a second time or the car gets rear-ended after it's been in an accident so um Crews reported that the vehicle stopped on top of the woman and that they uh, kept the vehicle in place until the first responders could arrive to assist the woman. This makes sense. And I, and I talked about this before on the All In podcast. Uh, I think 
one of the best practices is you don't move the car until the emergency people get there because if you move it you, you could cause more damage okay and if somebody has you know updated information uh, on how ems handles this my, my information is 30 years dated here um so the police instructed crews to brick the car while on top of the woman uh, and again that's standard operating procedure uh, and that's been confirmed now but what they didn't mention and again this is allegedly was that the vehicle also pulled the woman forward 20 feet uh, now this has been uh confirmed by crews um crews mentioned this is a in, in a detailed review of the hit and run published this week again they did not do the initial hit but um this week they published a detailed review Okay, so now here's the where, where it gets a little dicey. The California DMV is claiming that Cruz withheld this footage of the woman being dragged 20 feet from them in an accident review that took place the day after the, after the accident. Here's the quote from the DMV's order of suspension. During the meeting, the department was shown video footage of the accident captured by the AV's onboard cameras. The video footage presented to the department ended with the AV's initial stop uh, following the hard braking maneuver. Okay, great. Footage of the subsequent movement of the AV to perform a pullover maneuver was not shown to the department and crews did not disclose that any additional movement of the vehicle had occurred after the initial stop of the vehicle. The department only learned of the AV subsequent movement via discussion with another government agency. The department requested crews provide a copy of the video with additional footage, which was received by the department October 13, 2023. If this is true, this is really bad for crews because when deploying and being part of the beta, crews uh, is building trust with these agencies and the agencies and, and, and crews have a lot to lose. They're in partnership in putting this new technology out there. And part of that is to own what happens when accidents occur and accidents will happen in cars. We all know that. So you have to be um, absolutely transparent and you cannot in any way uh, lie. Uh, it's, it's that simple. And so why has this video not been released is my question. If you were Cruz, and again, now I'm going to get into speculation. Uh, so if Cruz did a good job here, they would have released the video, right? Now you can blur out the individual, but you would release some portion of the video if you were in the clear. I think you would do that. Now, I'm, there might be lawyers who say, don't do it because it's, you know, could incite the, the public or something, or there could be some more damages that would occur possibly. But yeah, I, I think for society, these agencies and the car companies should release the footage and the data. This way, multiple parties can see it. What they're doing right now, all the parties involved, is making us all wonder what is the truth. And in a vacuum, and I've said this before, when not presented with the facts in a vacuum, people will go different places. And the place people are going here is that Cruz's car dragged the woman and that they hit it on purpose. That's where your mind will go if they're not forthright. Now, another group of people will say, hey, these agencies are anti-tech or they've got it in for Cruz and, and they'll go down that conspiracy rabbit hole. Just release the videos. Um, you know, you want to be crystal clear about what you did right, what you did wrong, and then fix it. The fact that none of this data is out there um, points to, to me, uh, one of two possibilities. Um, <laughs> Cruz is at fault and they were ashamed of it and they were hiding something. There was a cover up, in other words, or maybe it's a jump ball. And I suspect that's the, um, that, that's the actual uh, situation here. I bet you it's one of these things where it's not clear how bad this is and maybe somebody made a very poor decision to, to hide this footage um but if the data was conclusive my opinion is uh you would release it quickly uh now of course big companies can behave strangely they can get caught up and say you know hey we don't have to you know there's some loophole heel they only asked for us to give them the accident information they didn't ask us to give us the post accident information right there might be some weasel lawyer who told them, oh, technically, we don't have to give them what happened after the accident. They only asked for the accident. So just give them the accident. You know, how Jason, think? I think that's just to break in here. I think you're exactly right. I think that's exactly what happened, because in that quote from the DMV's order of suspension, mm -hmm. they mentioned the department, meaning the DMV, only learned of the AV subsequent movement via discussion with another government agency. Mm -hmm. So Cruz did show this footage to another agency, but they just hid that part of it from the DMV. Right. Okay. So there it is. Producer Nick, uh, you know, working with me. 
uh, jcal slash Columbo in figuring this out. So, uh, you know, it's... I think the, the part about this that's so stupid, though, especially in San Francisco, is you have this total contingent of like anti-tech. These things are horrible. Yeah. They're throwing traffic cones on top of them to brick these things. You yep. have just validated all of those people exactly. by appearing like <laughs> this, you know, like this, this sets this them back a set, decade. It, it, I was about to say, I think this sets it back five years, maybe even a decade. Who knows? But I think, you know, self-driving cars in San Francisco, at least from Cruise are over. I don't think they give Cruise their license back. And, and you know what? If they did hide it, I can understand their argument, you know, um, because what happens? I mean, if you're hiding this, what else are you hiding? Right. Um, it makes them look like the, the tech overlord, the, the corporate evil overlord. It makes them look like that. That's literally yes, what it, it does. It makes it look like they're trying to get away with something. So just whoever made the decision here at, at Cruise, if this is in fact true, again, I, I got to put that disclaimer in there because there's weird stuff going on right now. It's hard to find the truth. Uh, you know, uh, maybe there's some mix up here. Maybe they gave them the second part of the video. They didn't see it. I don't know. But uh, this is a this is a mess. This is sloppy on all sides. and. Uh, yeah, this is just tragic for the industry because the truth is these things are going to save people's lives. So what a disaster. Ugh. You know, it's just, and that's the, the real problem here. As uh, Freeberg pointed out on All In when we discussed it, you, know, you got to take some risk to get the reward. The risk here is that, you know, hey, the car might drag somebody, right? But who knows if this had not been a cruise car, you know what I'm saying, Nick? And it hit them, it may have not done the aggressive braking. It might have killed the person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's where transparency matters. Remember I said before that a lot of times in the accident, it's the second hit that kills people, mm -hmm. you know, either the rear end or they, you know, they get out of the car, they start walking around, they try to flag somebody and then somebody clips them. And you always see that, right? Cops, God forbid, they're going up to the car and they get clipped by somebody who's on their phone. Maybe if you put this information out here, somebody would have said, hey, by the way, this thing stopped on a dime. A human couldn't have done that. Boom, and it would have hit somebody. This reminds me of the movie Flight remember not flight um sully remember sully i didn't uh, see Miracle sully but i do love flight flights that's up there but uh, in sully another great pilot movie they put people in a simulation right and they they try to say he could have gotten to teterboro but that was like math could have gone to teterboro maybe technically but when they actually put pilots in the simulation and they had him do a double bird strike they all died yeah and this guy landed in the hudson you know sully's the hero um so anyway it's just said did you see this other thing that was trending on uh did you see I got into a little bit of a Twitter beef again, Gen X versus Gen Z? Oh, man, you are you are getting... I stopped uh, in it again. You are getting <laughs> flamed right now. Ooh, Crazy. Ooh. I mean, there's a generation who've never commuted. I guess I, it's triggering to commute, but well, there's a video Let's just play right the clip now. first, and then you can re react to it, okay? I don't play the whole clip because... Not I the whole thing? Take, All right. Yeah. There was a clip on TikTok that went viral on X of a young woman who just graduated... Uh, and just got her first job crying, okay. um, crying about how much she hates her commute. But I will say in the clip, everybody's kind of framing it as, oh, nobody wants to work anymore. Uh, uh. But in the clip, she does say, I love my job. I would have no okay. problem with it if I could walk to work. I can't afford. And I think she's talking about Manhattan. She says, I can't oh, afford right. to live in the city. So I have to live at home. And I have like an hour commute plus each way. Yeah. So did I for a decade. And then I made money and then I moved to right, Manhattan. But did you, did you ever feel like, like your, the life was being sucked out of you from a really long commute when you get home at like eight o'clock uh, and it's I dark mean, out? I took the R train into Manhattan back and forth. It was long. Sometimes it took an hour, 15, sometimes it took 45 minutes and you know, I get a slice of pizza when I get off. I would, you know, get a cup of coffee on the way in, grab some, right, but you uh, had some donut, days where it. it was a hard, long day and it sucked. Yeah, right. And you were like, it man, sucked. this commute sucks. Right. Yes, did, did, did the commute suck sometimes? Yes. Right. That's her hot? point. Was it cold? I, but I didn't get on TikTok and cry about it. You, didn't, you couldn't get on TikTok and cry about it. There's no TikTok. Sure. There's no I TikTok. Blog post. <laughs> I don't I actually think any post. of the My points kids. she's making are that bad. And Okay, but just play it. it it's the entire Oh, the now, you, now you want to play it. Okay. Now I just you want to play the, the clip. Part. I'll tell you the part I want to play. Okay. The part I want to play is where she says, I have to leave my house at 7.30 and I don't get back to 6.15. Yeah, that, <laughs> because for, when you, that, it's funny. That's a little rough. Yeah. I know I'm probably being so dramatic and annoying. But this is my first yes, job, you are. like my first nine to well, yes. And she even admits that she's being dramatic and annoying. Okay, fine. fine. My job after college and I'm in person and I'm commuting in the city and it takes me forever to get there. There's no way I'm going to be able to afford living in the city right now. So that's off the table. Like, 
duh if i was able to walk to work and it would it'd be fine but i'm not okay so it literally enough. takes me like i leave here at, like i get on the train at 7 30 and i don't get home till like 6 15 early <laughs> yeah that's not that bad i want to also ask what i thought it was like 6 a.m and you get home at like 8 p.m come on man your dad my brother your dad producer nick Right, you, but you saw let's him just, leave the house at six o'clock. Yes, as a of course, but you have you to understand. Yeah, but and then guess you work what? Your ass. Off. Yes, but guess what? He also did. He would come home and say, "Oh my god, that commute sucked. I want to cry <laughs> right <laughs> That's now." True. That's fair literally enough, what he would enough. say. Okay, everybody fair thinks I mean, commuting sucks. It's yes. awful, and I think her <laughs> larger point is it is mm. so expensive to live in Manhattan right now. And you're not even is putting it? into the, like, this is a whole other thing, but yeah. this is a young woman. And right yeah. now, if you want to live in the city, in Manhattan, in San Francisco, you might have Three to grand. live in maybe not such a nice neighborhood. And guess what? I lived in San Francisco for two years. I had a lot of guy friends. I had a lot of friends that were women, young women. And guess what? Yeah. You know who gets messed with by homeless people and drug of addicts? Course. Is it ever yeah. young men? No, no. it's women and no. it's old people. So they have a whole other thing to worry about, sure. about living yeah, in no, like- I, I, I get that piece. That's that's a separate issue. But yeah, I, I, I mean- I think there's a confluence anyway, of things going on here with this. you think it's real? Let me ask that. Is it real or is this person doing engagement farming? Maybe a little bit of both. I'm not really sure. Both, I don't know. Maybe. I, I mean, got the sense of a little bit of both. Well, I feel okay. like I want to do something like this. I feel like I want to do a J Cal meltdown video and release it, but not tell people I'm doing it. Like, what could I have a meltdown? About? I, I don't know. But what I need you to do in order for you to actually talk about this video is I need you to have like an hour commute for a month straight every single day. Oh. Yes. And then I want no, you to just off, talk about how much it I'm sucks. I'm 50. The office is 10 minutes from wherever You're right, I am. Exactly. You, <laughs> what, yeah, you, you haven't had an that. hour commute since 1992. No, no. It's been a long time. I it's know. Been a long time since I had an hour commute. Yeah, no, no. That sucks. I, Can you I, say I, that she makes sucks. some valid points? Can you just admit that? Yes. She does make some valid points. But okay. the part that's triggering is, I, I, you know, with her disclaimer, yeah, maybe I did pile on. Because she did give the disclaimer. She says, I'm being annoying. I know. And she says, yes. if I could walk to work, I wouldn't, I, I'd never complain. Wouldn't I don't even care. Issue. Yeah. But the, the 730 to 615 got me. That was funny. I was like, yeah, that was, I didn't realize that on the first viewing. That's <laughs> pretty like, funny. That's that, that, that I was thinking, wait a second. It's 730, you get to work at 839. And then you're leaving at five. So you're actually working a, ni a literal nine to five. Yeah. Eight hours. I wonder if she's eating at her desk, but she's going to pay for a 40 hour week. She's literally doing the bare minimum. Let's be honest here. Um, and then she's like, I don't get to go to the gym and I don't get to date. And I was like, well, wait a second. I had an even worse schedule. I work like maybe I'd leave at seven, work at eight, eight 30, work till six 37, went to the gym with Chelsea Pierce. Then I might go on a date or I might go have dinner at 10 o'clock. Get to bed by 12, you know, one and get six hours of sleep. Yeah, but here's the, the thing. Day. You could jump on the R train at any time of the day. If you're uh -huh. taking Metro North home, if you're taking New Jersey Transit, uh -huh. like she is to the suburbs, mm -hmm. those Schedule. trains only leave at certain well, times. Did we find that out that she's doing this? The, the well, she's, on suburb she, thing? okay. Oh, here's from what I she's surmise. She's either in North Jersey, she's in mm -hmm. Westchester, or she's on, she's in Long Island somewhere. You know she what? has she a New York accent. That. There's a... Yeah, and that's the mitigating factor. The yeah, mitigating factor. and I, I think, you know, those, and now we're getting totally into the weeds and this is completely ridiculous, but I do yes. think that. Well, no, it's a double commute. She's got to get on the New York City subway and then you got to get on the And path, you have to you transfer. Get on Metro and North. when you're leaving those Transfer's trains- Transfer's a killer. Transfer's a killer. After a certain I time, agree. like the R train, you could jump on, it runs every five minutes, right? It's really slow, but it runs every couple minutes. Eh, 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes. Whatever. Yeah, but you know, Metro North, you miss your train, you're, you're at. You're, you're you're the next train you're getting is an hour later, right? So it's like a whole- yeah. yeah, no, I had friends. I think yeah, logistically, no, that, I don't like, think her points are that crazy here. No, As someone who's crying and the, yeah. I get home too late. Here's what I think. If I'm going to, I'm going to give some prescriptive advice. Um, okay. Commuting sucks. What I did was I very quickly just got the smallest possible apartment in Manhattan and, you know, split rent. Uh, and, and, you know, it's like get a tiny place and live in the city. That's my best advice. Better to live in a studio, the tiniest possible apartment but have the shortest commute because you, your quality of life will go up. I, I'm, totally. I, I understand that. Yeah. Get, yeah. Get the, uh, literally living in a studio apartment where like your bed and your kitchen are on the same thing. It's totally fine because you can, when you're in Manhattan, you're in a major city, you're going to be out anyway. You're a young person. You go to the gym, et cetera. Much better, much better. 
Well, you do what I did. You have a sick loft, but it doesn't have heat on the weekends and you're living illegally in a commercial. Loft. I just think the affordability Jake, problem yeah. in Manhattan right now is so crazy. That's, well, that's why I, that's why I hacked it when I was her age. I have I friends of mine that are now 28 years old that make good money that are like, I want to live in a two bedroom, but it, mm -hmm. everything in Manhattan in like a decent neighborhood is $6,000 and above. And I have no, to go to go Williamsburg one now. Just it's the one bedroom. Crazy. Studio. Yeah. Did you see the other one of the person crying about she was had to go serve sushi, but her she can't get a marketing job because she's up against people who have more experience. And then she says the degrees, the experience. No, I didn't. Did you see the degrees, and the experience. You didn't see the degrees, the experience. No, no. Nor do I care. Come on. What do we? <laughs> we there's everybody can make a video now about anything. Do we really need to ingest everyone's thoughts about no, the world? Like, come on. Who cares? Know, just the nature of these go. The woman is driving to like serve sushi and she's like my first job i make more as a server than i do at my first job and then she's like and i got a degree and i went eighty thousand dollars in debt for marketing and i'm like "Ooh, there's the mistake all right everybody we'll see you next time on this week in startups go check out the new website this week in startups.com we're playing with some ai you'll we'll enjoy it and uh yeah shout out producer nick a uh, welcome new guy to the team and uh, we'll see you all next time bye bye